for the invitation to speak. Uh, I want to tell you today about some work I've been doing on the lines of non-perturbative minimal superstring and the matrix integral duality. So many interesting string theory observables like scattering amplitudes contain contributions of order e to the minus 1 over g string arising from d instantons. Uh, however, if you just do world sheet perturbation theory around these d instantons, it's often ill-defined. And the resulting answers contain some undetermined constants that need to be fixed using certain other assumptions. So this has shown up both in the recent work of Balthazar, Rodriguez, and Yin in the C equals 1 matrix quantum mechanics and this older paper that computed annulus amplitudes in the C, C less than 1. So in this talk, I will explain the basic string field theory idea that allows us to overcome this fundamental obstacle with the string perturbation theory. Uh, which is due to Ashok Sen in the last few years, which were developed, again, in the context of the two-dimensional string theory. However, these methods by now have been generalized to tackle various non-perturbative effects in 10D critical superstring theory and have led to highly non-trivial checks of superstring dualities by these authors here. So our setting will be the minimal superstring, and we will show that this uh, string field theory procedure uh, produces answers that are finite, non-zero, and they match perfectly with the dual matrix integrals. OK, here's a list of papers that I've written about this, and there should be a paper that to appear soon. OK, before I move on, I would like to uh, uh, say that there's another approach to non-perturbative uh, minimal string theory, which has been pioneered by Clifford Johnson in the recent years. I will not have much to say about that, but you guys should read his papers. OK, so. You might ask, this procedure has now passed the test of even 10D critical superstring theory. Uh, so why am I studying minimal string theory with this method, and uh, what do I want to really tell you? So basic lesson is that simplifying toy models as much as possible is valuable. And this is shown by this fact that in this current context, uh, there was an apparent mismatch between 2D string theory and matrix quantum mechanics in an annulus one-point function. And we were able to resolve this by first analyzing the analogous problem in the minimal string setting. So that's why it's useful to study toy models, and that's why I'm uh, telling you about this today. OK, so here's a brief introduction to the minimal string duality for those of you who might not be familiar with it. Uh, so the first point is that 3 plus 1 dimensional gauge theories are hard, even in the large n limit. Uh, the matrix A mu ij tx has uh, color indices ij, but it also has these mu t and x uh, floating around. But only the ij indices are responsible for the topological expansion. So this motivates the study of zero plus zero dimensional gauge theories where there are no mu t and x, and the only field is just mij with color indices running from 1 to n. And so the path integral in this setting is just an ordinary integral over one or more matrices. And it strips down a Tuft's large N idea to its bare bones, just the color indices. OK, so research along these lines in the 80s and 90s led to a precise duality between non-critical string theory and double-scaled matrix integrals. And it's the earliest known example of a duality between gravitational and a non-gravitational system. And uh, works by these authors and many others taught us that. OK, so now I will introduce in more detail the two sides of this duality. And then I will describe the observable that we are computing. So uh, the matrix integral side is easier to describe. So we are just computing the partition function. Here it's an integral over one n by n matrix, uh, n. Uh, n is big. T is the Tuft coupling. And you have some potential that I have taken here for uh, illustration to be a quadratic and a quartic term. And uh, if you want to imagine, imagine G2 to be positive and G4 to be negative. But we don't just study that matrix integral as a function of n, t, g2, and g4. We take this particular limit. So you tune t to this particular value, uh, where epsilon is small. And at the same time, you take n to infinity, keeping this kappa fixed. So what happens is that uh, in this limit, the Feynman diagrams that contribute are very big. So at a given genus order, uh, the number of vertices in the Feynman diagram very, very big. So then you can take a continuum limit on the string world sheet. And basically, this kappa starts to play the role of a genus counting parameter. OK, so that's the matrix side. What's the world sheet CFT? Uh, this was already introduced by various uh, speakers. So there, we have three decoupled sectors uh, that are only coupled by the Virasoro constraints. 
Uh, there's a two comma p minimal model, which has central charge less than one, so that needs to be made up by a Liouville CFT with central charge bigger than 25, and there's the BC GO system with central charge negative 26. So I just want you to remember that there is this p parameter uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the game. Okay, so, so those are the two sides of the duality. What is the observable we are studying? We are just studying this partition function z that I already wrote. Uh, in the matrix integral, it's, uh, it's exponential of a power series expansion in kappa to the negative two. So C0 is the sphere term, C1 is the torus, C2 is genus two. And on the string theory side, to compute these, you have to sum over all closed Riemann surfaces with no external vertex operators. So you need to do a moduli space integral uh, to get all these individual terms. So here I've just copied the Z from the previous slide, but now I have added the superscript zero to it to remind you that it's the perturbative contribution. And then we can have some non-perturbative contributions that here are denoted by Z1. So we compute the ratio Z1 over Z0. It's the exponential of another series in kappa, but this time it starts at order kappa, not kappa square. And it has this D1 term and a log kappa term. So on the string theory side, the blue uh, term, the kappa, is computed by the disk topology, and the brown terms are computed by the annulus. So there's both a constant piece and a logarithmic piece in kappa. And basically, uh, we want to compute this brown piece today. So the exponential of disk can be written as e to the negative 1 over g string. That's the uh, action of the d brain or the d instanton that you're studying. And n is the exponential of the annulus diagram. And then, of course, you'll have subleading corrections that we will not uh, consider today. The result, I just want to flash here. Uh, uh, for a particular non-perturbative correction, the exponential of the annulus is like the square root of G string, a factor of I, and a precise numerical factor which has some trig function of this P parameter that appeared. And I've chosen the normalization of G string so that the tension of the instanton is just G string to the negative one. So the goal will be in the next uh, 15 minutes or so to explain to you uh, where this formula came from, from the string theory side. OK, so the string theory computation. So the disk and annulus are world sheets with the boundary. So we need to specify conformal boundary conditions for the components of the world sheet CFT. So mostly, the Liouville CFT has this discrete family of ZZ boundary conditions. And we will stick to the 1, 1 ZZ brain, which is the most fundamental of them all. So basically, there's a bootstrap problem, a boundary bootstrap problem that has been solved with this particular set of conformal boundary conditions. So since it's solved, we know the open string spectrum uh, that stretches between a 1, 1 ZZ brain and itself. So the, the string annulus A is a moduli space integral over this T parameter in the trace in the open string Hilbert space of uh, this operator. And you put together the known bootstrap answers, and you get this infinite sum with some plus and minus signs. Uh, there are plus and minus signs because the BC ghosts are Grassmann odd, so you have some uh, minus signs in the game, and there's the B0, C0 sitting there in the, in the trace. You need those because there are uh, ghost zero modes on the cylinder. Okay, so the problem is simply that this A is ill-defined. So if you look at the T expansion of this integral at large T, there's one term that's e to the 2 pi T, and there's a negative 2, and this A is ill-defined. So you can't uh, compute it, and you might say, okay, what is going on? Are we missing something? So we will now see that e to the a is a better quantity to consider, and it is possible to make it well-defined. So here I have written a general expression with some bosonic weights hb and some fermionic weights hf. This would be a general trace. It would look like that. The t integral that computes the annulus can now be done. It gives you one half the logarithm of fermions in the numerator and the bosons in the denominator. So when you exponentiate this, the logarithm goes away, and you get the fermion weights in the numerator and the bosons in the denominator without the log, and that you can write as this Gaussian integral. You introduce a bosonic field phi b and uh, Grassmann uh, pairs pf and qf, and this just is explicitly equal to that. So the point is that the annulus diagram in the open string channel is a sum over single string states, and you exponentiate the annulus the exponentiate quantity is basically just the Gaussian approximation to the path integral of the d brain world volume field theory. So each single, straight, uh, single string state that you had 
Now you just have one field for each of those states, the phi Bs and the PF and QF. So essentially, this formula that I wrote for the exponential of the annulus can be basically be thought of as the path integral of the world volume field theory of the d-instanton that we are considering. Or in other words, it's also the path integral of the relevant open string field theory at the Gaussian level, so no interactions, it's just free. Okay, so now let's deal with this tachyon. So we had this e to the 2 pi t term, which is coming from a state with L0 equals negative 1. It multiplies that ghost number 1 field, C1 of 0. So capital T is the field. And so its path integral contains this e to the plus half t square. Now to make this integral well-defined, uh, you need to choose a multiple of the steepest descent contour on the imaginary axis. So typically, it might not contribute, the saddle point might not contribute, or it might contribute plus minus one, plus minus a half. But we'll ignore this constant for now, as we'll see later that there's an analogous set of choices in the matrix integral. So for now, we just do this uh, integral from minus i infinity to i infinity, and this i is basically that y, the n had an i in the answer. You remember there was an i in that whole expression for the annulus. Okay, so we've dealt with the tachyon, and notice that the path integral intuition was useful because it told you that you're really dealing with an integral over a negative mass squared field. Okay, but now we have this minus two, which is these uh, fermion zero modes. So we are dealing with d minus one brains, but it's helpful to first review the dp world brain theory for p bigger than or equal to zero. So you can think of a d3 brain for concreteness, where the gauge theory would be some 4D gauge theory. So it's a gauge theory that has an a mu of k field. So there are, you need Fadif pop of capital B, capital C goes for the perturbation theory to be well-defined. And basically, before you do any Fadif pop of the a mu of k field multiplies that particular string vertex operator, a C1 alpha minus 1, and C there. But there's another field which is often not written, uh, which is the psi of k field it multiplies just a C0. So it's a scalar from the point of view of space-time, from the point of view of the D-brain world volume theory, but it's there. And this K is just a momentum that is valued in RP plus 1. Okay, so we have these two fields before any doing Fadiev Popov, but then gauge transformations are generated as follows. You have to act with the BRST charge on ghost number 0 fields, like just e to the IKX without any Cs. So if theta is the gauge parameter, a mu shifts like usual, as you're used to, uh, uh, and then psi shifts by k squared times theta. Okay, so that is the gauge freedom that we use to set psi of k to zero, and that's what introduces this C of k and B of k uh, Fadif pop of ghost fields on the D-brain world volume that multiply the state of ghost number zero and ghost number two. Okay, so this I've just copied from the previous slide. But for d instantons, the world volume is zero plus zero dimensional, so there's no momentum, k. So the only thing you have are two discrete states, a capital C multiplying the zero and a capital B multiplying the C1, C minus one, uh, zero. So essentially, recall that this trace in the open string Hilbert space had this negative two there, and what I'm telling you now is this minus two is essentially coming from the capital C and the capital B. Okay, so we've identified the fields uh, that are leading to this problem of the minus two. So this uh, expression for e to the a contains this path integral of e to the zero times bc, and that's zero. Uh, okay, so that, that is the problem. Okay, so on a, now what should we change? The thing is that on a d-instant on world volume, there is no a mu, right? Because you don't have the mu index at all. So, so the, I mean, yeah, it's just not there. And here is the psi of k from previously. It was multiplying the c0 e to the ikx and shifting by k squared times theta. But now, again, there is no momentum. So psi just does not change under this gauge transformation. Psi is gauge invariant. So because psi is gauge invariant, you cannot set it to zero like we did before. So in other words, this fadif popov procedure that led to setting psi equal to zero and the introduction of capital B and capital C is just illegal for the case of a d instanton. So the remedy is to just un pop off this path integral and get rid of that db dc e to the zero bc and just replace it with this psi integral. 
the e to the minus psi square you get from this kinetic term that Ted wrote uh, in his talk, one half psi QB psi. But you should remember to divide by the volume of the gauge group. Now, again, the gauge group here is nothing fancy. Uh, usually, you would have a U1 rotation for each point on the world volume, but the world volume is just a point. So it's a finite group, and you need to compute the volume of that group uh, properly, and that gives a factor of the open string coupling there in the denominator. Okay, so now you can convert G0 to the tension of the uh, D-brain as well. So here's the point. So finally, this N, uh, you have the tachyon integral, uh, you have the psi integral uh, divided by the volume of the gauge group, and then these integrals over all the other fields, the dot, 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 that I didn't write down explicitly, but they're there. And you just do the whole thing, and you get the answer that I was telling you uh, about. So the I came from the tachyon, the square root of G string, which is basically this G0 factor in the upper equation, came from uh, this, this gauge volume, and the integrals over all the other fields give you some infinite product, and the cotangent has some infinite product representation. That's why the cotangent showed up here. It it's, comes from some infinite product. Okay, uh, good, thank you. Okay, so that's the string theory calculation. I just want to summarize it. So somehow the world sheet theory is producing an answer for the annulus that is in a bad gauge. And string field theory helps us identify the culprit modes. And the new world volume path integral with the psi field in there produces a finite, unambiguous answer. Now, this problem doesn't stop here with the uh, annulus normalization, basically because Feynman diagrams with internal lines arise from limits in moduli space where the Riemann surface degenerates. And uh, the world volume path integral now includes the psi field. So the psi field will appear on internal lines in Feynman diagrams. So you have to keep it around when you compute scattering amplitudes and so on, it will contribute on the internal propagators. Okay, so the matrix integral computation, actually there's not uh, uh, much uh, new to say because this computation was already done in the 90s and refined in the 2000s by Mourinho, Schiappa, and Weiss. So uh, a single eigenvalue in the matrix feels an effective potential, uh, that is the combination of the bare potential and this Coulomb repulsion coming from the Vandermond. And uh, for these two comma P family, the effective potential looks like this. So the eigenvalues are on the positive x-axis, and when you go on the negative x-axis, you see some finite number of extrema. So all you need to do is compute the height of one of those extrema. That's this kappa times V effective of xn star. And calculate the Gaussian integral around it. That gives you the one over square root of kappa, and also gives you some number d1. Uh, the point is you calculate, I will uh, spare you the details, but the answer precisely matches with the string theory computation with that cotangent and I and everything. Okay, so there's a comment about contours. It seems to be that if we restrict ourselves to these eigenvalue instantons, the duality between matrix integral and string theory holds for perturbation theory in one over kappa around each saddle point. Uh, we need to specify a defining contour for the eigenvalues that will pick out a particular linear combination of the leftist thimbles that we need to sum over. But the string theory also needs a corresponding defining contour in the complex plane of this open string tachyon. So in some sense, after you've matched the thimbles one by one, uh, the contour is a choice that you get to make once on both sides. Okay, so here are just a few generalizations uh, without any details. You can do this for two matrix integrals that are dual to the P prime comma P minimal string. Uh, you can do a multi-instanton configuration with many instantons of type one, some instantons of type two, et cetera. This was done also for the Vera Soro minimal string by Collier, Eberhardt, Muehlmann, and Rodriguez. And uh, right now we are uh, about to finish a paper that also generalizes it to the two comma four K minimal superstring. Uh, that was previously studied by uh, these authors. Uh, the extra new thing in this case is that uh, uh, th there are two phases of the, of the matrix integral. There's a gapped two-cut phase, and there's an edgeless phase where the leading non-perturbative effect is from two instantons. And analogously to this capital B and capital C states that I showed you, uh, the culprit states are the following NS sector states. 
that have the beta half and the gamma minus one half oscillators going there. So just to show you, the two-cut phase looks like this, where the eigenvalues are from at less than minus one and bigger than minus one. And for the edgeless phase, the eigenvalues go on the real axis, and then you have these instantons that are now complex. And uh, these are actually wrong sheet or ghost instantons, uh, as was uh, these ghost instantons were really emphasized in a really nice paper by Mourinho, Schiappa, and Schwick. Uh, okay, so those are crucial in this phase. Okay, here are some future questions. Uh, I would like to personally have a deeper understanding of the role of these ghost instantons. What are they really doing? And also a deeper understanding of the string theory description of the whole states in C equals one, matrix quantum mechanics. Uh, yeah, those are the maybe some things to think about that are very similar to ideas I've discussed. And here's a summary, uh, just to leave you with it. The world sheet description of string observables is, in, in, is in, inadequate in the presence of d instantons. And we discussed in this talk how to use insights from string field theory to compute a finite, unambiguous answer. And these answers match perfectly with the dual matrix integrals. But before I end, uh, I would like to just uh, thank uh, uh, my collaborators. Among them is Ashok and also these two uh, young students. Dan is a PhD student at Stanford, and Chitrang is a postdoc at uh, UPenn. And I would also like to thank Douglas for first suggesting this problem, Douglas Stanford. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Raku, for this nice talk. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. Hi, hi Raku. So, um, I, I just want to make sure I understood your comment about the choice of contours correctly. Yeah. So, um, were you saying that uh, the choice of contours for the tachyon part of the instanton computation has, has, has an ambiguity which has uh, a counterpart in the matrix model computation? So, like, these ambiguities also match? Is, is that what you were saying? Basically, I'm saying that on the string theory side, there's this open string tachyon field which can think of as take some values in some complex plane. It's like some complex field in general. And then there is the eigenvalue plane. And there's, it seems to be from the structure of these saddle points that a choice of contour in the eigenvalue plane is basically the same as the choice of a contour in the open string tachyon plane. Mm -hmm. And since the structure of the saddle points is identical, the way those contours would get deformed to pick out the relevant saddle points would be the same. So essentially, after you've matched the two sides thimble by thimble, uh, that's, that's like really strong uh, set of data. That's basically what I'm saying. And how you stitch those thimbles together into one integral is sort of a second step that you can do. Uh, but it's, it somehow seems that you got more than what holographic duality might have needed. So I wanted to ask a follow-up question. So yeah. like, do you think that something similar is also there in, say, ADS5, CF4? But there, like, uh, N equals 4 supremacist contour, presumably it's more well-defined than these double-scale matrix integrals. You mean in doing, let's say, perturbation theory around the vacuum? Yeah, I, I would think, yeah, what would be a kind of a non-perturbative saddle there? Do you have something in mind specifically? Yeah, I guess like a D instantons. Uh, oh, which okay. Are, which are instantons in any Yeah, I'm less confident about that case because I've not studied it. So maybe we could ask this in type 2B string theory, right? So type 2B string theory has D instantons and it needs these uh, D instanton corrections to make the answer S duality consistent with S duality. And there I think she had a slide which he didn't go over in his talk. Maybe he has some comment. Uh, so in the case of... Uh, D and TD instanton in type 2B, there indeed one could wonder um, about, I, I mean, the, the thing is, um, for the BPS instantons, we have uh, an ambiguous, you know, there's this unambiguous uh, prediction from mm -hmm. supersymmetry and, and S duality. Mm -hmm. But I think in, in, but in those cases, there's also no apparent uh, counter ambiguity. I mean, the, the counter ambiguity, for example, will show up if you have this, quote unquote, tachyonic open stream on the, 
d-instanton, which will occur on the pair of d and anti d instanton. But, um, but th those are, but somehow those also compute corrections, you know, kind of that are uncharged, so, uh, you know, there's uncharged d sector, that they're corrections to a preservative series that we do not know how to sum up in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's like, you know, maybe there's some ambiguity here, but this ambiguity is tied to, maybe it's tied to the ambiguity of how to sum up the preservation series, and the, which is not understood. Okay. Okay, thanks. Are there any other comments? Okay, thank you. Here are some announcements, or is the gong show, or both?